Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro RPG. Now at this point in the video, usually I'd be talking about what won the poll this week. And this game certainly didn't. In fact, it came fourth in the most recent poll, in the weeks leading up to Christmas, where I was deciding what I was going to be doing over the Christmas period. But this is the game that I received the most feedback about. I received loads of emails and loads of comments. Everybody could just asking, what the hell? Dallas the television role-playing game, why does this exist? So I've done some digging, and I think there's quite an interesting story to be told. Now, as usual, we'll be covering that on the desktop in a wee second, and I'll be back at the end of the video with some other poll-related stuff and some other channel-related stuff. But before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my patrons, who this week I have been told we are 99% sure they didn't shoot JR. So there you go. Now, these guys are great. They help support the channel, and they help make all of this possible. So their efforts are very much appreciated. Now, if you'd like to join them and help support the channel, or you'd like to gain access to these videos a week early, or you'd like to gain access to one of the other levels of patronage, we've got a Patreon in the description down below. If you check it out, it'd be very much appreciated. But anyway, let's have a look at Dallas the Television Role-Playing Game. So, this is the Dallas the Television Role-Playing Game, which came out from SPI, which stands for Simulations Publications Incorporated, and it came out in 1980. And here's the second ever licensed role-playing game, coming only after the Star Trek Adventures in the Final Frontier, which we covered on the channel before. Now, the reason why a product so different to other role-playing games came out this early is a bit of a story. Now, SPI had been in existence for quite a while. They had been founded in 1969 and were creating war games and board games up to that point. And they had some experience in licensing because they'd created the Dawn of the Dead board game in 1978 and went on to create the Dragon Slayer, based on the movie of the same name, in 1981. So they had experience in getting licenses, but they were also dipping their toe into the role-playing market and had created a couple of role-playing games of their own. But what they were looking at was, why was this new type of game? When board games, for example, had numerous types of source materials, so were based on different television shows and different movies and all that, why were role-playing games only based on science fiction and fantasy? There were no other role-playing games really around that time which were based on any other settings. They were just this very geeky core. So they wondered if using their experience with licensing, they could license something which was very much part of the zeitgeist at the time, and Dallas was. When this game came out, it was right in the middle of the Who Shot JR, which was getting on the news, was being really part of culture at that time, where people were wondering between a couple of seasons of the show what had happened to this character and who'd done it. And so SPI were trying to catch on to this. And they thought, well, we'll license this big thing, we'll create a role-playing game, and we'll see if there's a market there. We'll see if we can expand role-playing out to much larger than just the geeks. We can see if we can get this on tabletops and get families playing it. Now, obviously, this wasn't a success. And this didn't go well. In 1982, TSR called in a bunch of loans they'd given SPI and basically took all the licensing away from them and started selling off the stock. And SBI itself was completely wound up by TSR in 1987. So it's a bit of a sad ending to the company. It wasn't just down to this. They produced a large variety of games, but this was very much a terrible selling game. Cost them a lot in licensing and was nowhere in success. Now, while it says it's the television role-playing game, it really only is a role-playing game in a very rough fashion. It's far more like a customizable card game, whereas the characters have various attributes that they use against one another. There's not a lot of role-playing goes on, although you could kind of use it that way, because this is all about contract negotiations, um, intimidating people, seducing people, etc. But let's have a look in. So, we've got... A nice credits page looking like a movie or TV program at the top here with the instructions to read it to the director. So instead of a games master or a dungeon master, we've got a director in this. And it talks through the introduction. So Dallas is a family role-playing game based on the popular television series of the same name. It's a nature of role-playing games such as Dallas to bring the world it reflects to life in an especially dynamic manner by allowing each player to assume the role of a major character in that world. 
well, you're not going to be creating a character at all. You're going to be playing somebody out of the TV series. And in fact, the way it's made up is very much like a television show. So we've got things like scripts, which are the different adventures. Um, we talk about Dallas as a role-playing game. We've got character roles, the director. We've got different types, major and minor characters, organizational characters. So like the police would be an organizational character rather than um, a bunch of minor characters. We've got the values, which are the abilities. And you've got them... So we don't have Dungeon Dragons-like stats here of stick, uh, strength, stamina, dexterity. We've got persuasion, coercion, seduction, and investigation. And we've also got power and luck, where they can bring those into play. Um, characters attempt to affect one another using their abilities to persuade, coerce, seduce, and investigate. Uh, successful attack... Effect attempt obliges the target that attempt to give something up. Control, information, power, etc. And that's what it's all going to be about. Using your various abilities to sway the other characters into handing over control so you end up fulfilling all your goals for that uh, script. Uh, talks through the director, game components. Um, this is just one PDF I'm looking through. It obviously came as a bunch of bo booklets in a cardboard box. Um, how to read character cards, sequence of play. So we've got commentary. So we talk about setting up the scene. Um, the director phase. The director sets the first scene by telling each player their secrets and other special information. Negotiation. Players trade character cards, power, or anything else. And conflict phase. Director determines the sequence in which players will undertake conflict resolution. Players then take turns resolving one conflict at a time until the uh, using their character's abilities and other values. And that's what it's about. It's all about negotiating things to gain power. Um, you're not going to turn around and sock somebody in the mouth over a board meeting about gaining access to new oil fields or whatever. You're going to be talking about getting a contract. You're going to be revealing that their wife had an affair. You're going to be using something which will make them fear, you know, bring out dirty secrets in their past. So we've got character interaction, negotiation, conflict fa phases, character abilities and conflict resolution. How to use power, because characters have a certain amount of power which they can bring to affect everything else. Um, what else we've got? Use of controlled characters. So you can bring minor characters in under control of your major character and use them as well. If they are better at something than you, you can send them off to do something else. They can join the negotiations on your part. And it talks through dealing with illegal acts. So if you are revealing that the characters have broken somewhere to get a secret, and then you can reveal the fact that they were involved in a criminal act of breaking in somewhere, that gives you extra power. Um, and then we've got how to win the game. Because it's a role-playing game, and there are no winners. The w games just have fun. No, nope, this game, there's an aim to win. It's Dallas, you're trying to get control over other characters. You're trying to win your goals. And you're not working as a party, you're not working together, although temporary alliances can be set up. Uh, this is mainly you're trying to beat everybody else. As I said, it's more like a collectible card game of some description. Then we've got script one, The Great Claim, where they have found a authentic Spanish land grant, which would affect the price of properties around... South Fork Ranch, where the Ewings, the main characters in Dallas, are set. And that would influence their family. It would have an effect. If their rivals were to get control of that, then it's going to affect them badly. If they were to get it, it's going to boost their riches. So we've got J.R. He's come across an old Spanish land grant, which, however dubious, can be useful in depressing the value of many oil properties. Um, his wife, Sue Ellen Ewing. You have run up a string of bad debts. Um, you're trying to keep them out of the pe uh, press and stop people find out. Uh, Jock Ewing, you've heard about them. And so on and so forth through all the different characters. And then we've got um, special information for this episode. So we've got different items. So Jock has a bad case of indigestion which appears at the moment to be a heart attack. So during one of the scenes, the character playing, or the player playing Jock can have this uh, indigestion which people think is a heart attack and he's out of that uh, round. Uh, he's out of that scene and can't do anything. 
and will be especially weak because people can take advantage of it. But that can then be used against them because they've taken advantage of a man they thought were dying. Um, we've got various other things. Sue Ellen's reckless spending pays off. She hits the Irish sweepstakes, increasing her persuasion by four for the rest of the episode. We've got different scenes. So as the information comes out, a lawyer wanting to work against the Ewings and um, help the local community finds out about it. Um, however, in scene two, it turns out they don't have a physical copy of it. Uh, so that affects things. Um, scene three, the director should be looking for ways to prevent the characters from getting a lock on victory. Um, so if Jock was winning, then making him have this indigestion, this uh, fake heart attack, would take him out of the play and allow other players to um, boost their influence. Uh, scene four, nothing should be left, so everything else goes into it. You know, we've got an automobile accident, um, a bribe of a Justice Department official. We can throw all that in in the last, second last scene to influence everything and shake things up a bit. And then we've got scene five, the end of the episode. And we've got an information uh, summary here. So we've got different characters, uh, different people from the uh, local press who they would be influencing. Um... The Dallas Cowboys Redskins football tickets can be given to every, anyone. And we've got another one, Sweet Oil. Same sort of thing. Down along the coast, um, JR just returned to the Dallas with a showboat tan. At the office, he told Bobby and Alexis Blanchard that he had been to business in Mexico, but stopped off in Brownsville and Port Isabel on his way back. Um, but people are doubtful about that. Um, what's happening? A year ago, you hit upon a risky scheme that might pay big dividends. Briber opened up in Padre Island National Seashore for development. So you've been away, but you've found this way of making profit, and everybody's going to be trying to find out what your secret is and benefit off that as well. Um, we've got the script writer's guide, so including director's notes, script writer's note. So we go through the director's notes. Um, how to modify the script, how to teach people the rules, giving out player briefings, explaining to players how to negotiate, what to do with fewer than nine players, because there are that many characters, um, how to keep the game moving, and records keeping. How to write your own game scripts, so how to come up with storylines. It's got a bunch of suggestions here. Um, creating your own scripts. We've got plot devices, so lots of things you can drop into these to influence things. You know, government plans to begin large-scale oil purchase to build up a national reserve. Alcoholic depression causes player to be absent a scene. A phone call from a senator in Washington. Use this to set a scene. Also can stop coercion or investigation. We've got loads of these. We've got uh, character bi biographies. Um, so various not major characters but side characters which can be brought in. Information about them to use. Um, organizational characters, so we've got the Oil Trade Association, local press, local government, local police, etc. And we've got background information, talking through Dallas Television Show, what the situation in Texas is, um, lots and lots of information on Texas, Dallas the city, Texas politics. And then we're on to a sample scene to sort of explain how the scene plays out. Including, you know, Ellie begins by announcing she will persuade Sue Ellen to give m uh, her Mustafa Quatra. Sue Ellen says she would like to show Ellie something first. So we're entering discussion phases. It shows what people are trying to do and what dice rolls are involved. And then we're on to the major characters. Now we've got a sheet here which shows all the character stats. But every player can see everybody else's stats anyway. So we've got information for the director... Um, player's rules outline. So we've got JR. And the way this works, we can see that JR's got all his stats in the darkened line here, but you can see everybody else's stats as well. The way it works is the person initiating the skill attempt, so somebody trying to persuade, if JR's trying to persuade, he's using the first number, 20. And the other person's using the second number. So if he's trying to persuade Pamela Barnes Ewing, She's got a persuasion defense of 17. So the difference is three. Now what you're trying to do is roll 2d6 under the difference between them. So the larger the gap, the more likely you are succeeding. And the closer the gap, 
the least chance. Until eventually, if there's a difference of only one, then you cannot succeed. So there's no, uh, no value in attempting. And if the difference is greater than 12, you're automatically succeeding. But anyway, um, from that you can see which ones it's worth giving a try to. All of these numbers are fairly high. Um, certain characters you're just going to be choosing, so you're going to be trying to do seduction against people. Now, seduction's a slightly odd one. I was amused by the idea of it, but it does lay out that you're only allowed to seduce people of the opposite sex and people who aren't part of your family. So JR cannot be seducing his dad to try and influence things, which I thought was a great pity because that's probably where the largest difference. Um, Jock Ewing has the lowest um, seduction, or lowest one of his stats is 15 in seduction. So other people would be good to seduce him, but JR can't do that, being both the same gender and part of the same family. Ah. Anyway, carrying on through. Every character sheet also has a player's rule outline. So you cut out the page, you give it to the player, and they've got the rules on the back, as well as having everything about their character. We've got Jock Ewing, we've got Pamela Barnes Ewing, Cliff Barnes, Bobby Ewing, Ellie Southworth Ewing, Sue Ellen Shepard Ewing, Lucy Ewing, Ray Krebs, and various minor characters on little cards. Um, the oil associations, we saw all of these earlier, and we've got various things which can be handed out, the Spanish land grant mineral rights, as they're handed around for the first adventure. And that's it. Now, as I said, it's not much a role-playing game, because it doesn't inspire you much to do anything than just choose an attribute and justify it. So you're using your seduction skill. So you're finding a way to seduce that character to get what you want. You're trying to manipulate them. You're trying to negotiate or whatever. And you're just justifying that in play. There's no real role-playing as such. I suppose if you were very familiar with the TV show, the justifications might come because you would know how J.R. or um, Jock or Sue Ellen would act and you could talk that out, and that might influence a lot of people who are big fans of the TV show. But as an outsider, I'm afraid there's not much I know about these characters, so it would be very mechanical if I was playing it, just going for the rules. So that was Dallas the Television Role-Playing Game, which is a brave attempt from SPI to attempt to get role-playing past the core audience of people who are into fantasy and science fiction. Sadly, it didn't work, and role-playing just seemed to appeal to us geeks and nerds. But, as I said, it was a brave attempt and really interesting idea. It's sad that we haven't seen more of this again since 1980. Now, in the weeks since I ran the poll in which Dallas came fourth, I decided to run another couple of polls before I start up my regular ones again. Because, while I can sit here and speak and think that I represent a large part of my audience, Sometimes my opinions seem to be controversial, and I receive a lot of feedback telling me how wrong I am. So I was intrigued by a few things. So I put up a couple of polls just to get some feedback and to test the waters. Now the first poll I put up was asking which was the most recent edition of Dungeons & Dragons you'd played. Not which was your favourite. My favourite is 3rd edition. I absolutely love that version. I think it's the best. But... Most recently, I played 5th edition, back in May of 2023, and in 2022 I was actually playing basic Dungeons & Dragons. So, they're my two recent ones, but which is the most recent you've played, no matter what your favourite is? And it came out to be 5th edition, with 32% of the vote, people saying that was their most recently played. Which is what I kind of expected, because Dungeons & Dragons does create such a large part of the market that it's kind of unavoidable. In second place was Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st and 2nd edition, with 24% of the vote. And the original Mensa Basic Beckme uh, version came in on 21% in 3rd position. 3rd edition, or 3.5 edition, came in on 16%, which is kind of sad. As I said, that's my favourite edition, so I was sad to see that it doesn't get that much played. And in last position, unsurprisingly, was 4th edition on only 6%. And I don't think that shocks anybody at all. While it does have its advocates, let's be honest, most people have bad opinions of 4th edition. 
Now as my second poll, what I thought I would ask was what would make you buy more Dungeons & Dragons stuff? What could Wizards of the Coast do? And at the top option I put, obviously I'm only putting up five options, maybe other people have far more ideas, but the top option was as long as the price is good and it's something that people want, 40% of people will buy more Dungeons & Dragons. So if Wizards of the Coast keep their prices low and produce things that people want, then people buy for them, ignoring all the politics of the past year, all the open license stuff, all the redundancies at the end of the year. People won't care as long as it's a good product at a good price. That got 40%. Second, if Dungeons & Dragons was sold off to an independent company. So Wizards of the Coast gets rid of Dungeons & Dragons, they keep doing Magic the Gathering and whatever else, but Dungeons & Dragons is given to another company. Now 21% of people say they would buy more in that case. 18% um, say they don't care who owns it, as long as it makes good games. Um, in fourth position was if Wizards of the Coast was independent from Hasbro. So the idea of separating Wizards of the Coast from Hasbro and operating it for gamers rather than the over, uh, overly large corporate structure. That came in on 12%. And only 9% of people wanted a change of senior management. So getting rid of the Microsoft people that they brought in, all the marketing people, only 9% of people cared if that changed. So those two polls told me that I'm on the same wavelength as my audience, which I'm very glad to hear. As I said, I receive a lot of feedback sometimes when I say things telling me how wrong I am. But I like to feel that I am generally on the same wavelength as the people who are watching these videos. And it's very gratifying to find out that the audience does generally agree with my point of view. That I'm not just a complete whack job out here talking rubbish. Although, I'll admit, a lot of the time I probably am. But with those two polls out of the way, we're back to finding out what we're going to be covering in future weeks. So, I'm opening a Retro Adventures poll. And this time we've got five Retro Adventures all from round about 1990, a couple of from before, a couple are just past. First up, we've got Tales from the Ether for Space 1889. Now this is a compilation of five adventures, I think it is, set in different places across the solar system. So we've got one on Mercury, one on Venus, one on Earth, one on Mars, and one in the orbit of Earth. Now this is interesting ideas and allowing us to explore the entirety of this setting. Because while Space 1889 often focused on Mars and Martians, we've got to remember much of the solar system was accessible in this Victorian steampunk setting. Second up, we've got Other Space for Star Wars role-playing game from 1989. Now this is an adventure I've run a couple of times, I've played through. It's absolutely fantastic, but lots of people seem to look down their nose on it because it's very much kind of out of Star Wars. It's getting stranded in a parallel dimension. But let's see if it wins and we can cover it in more detail. Next up, we've got the Demos Mandate for the Buck Rogers RPG from TSR. Now, this came out in 1991. This was while the company was owned by the same people who owned the licensing for Buck Rogers. So, of course, they brought out a Buck Rogers role-playing game because they had control of all the licensing for it. And it's an interesting idea. Um, Buck Rogers obviously has a long history going back into black and white uh, cinema uh, Saturday matinees, as well as the 80s series, and I think there was a more recent series as well. I don't quite remember. I don't think I watched it. But Buck Rogers has a long history, so this role-playing game is part of it, and it'd be interesting to have a look at how it translated the material from what we're more familiar with to a role-playing game. After that, we've got Scared Stiffs for the Ghostbusters role-playing game. Now, I've run some Ghostbusters recently, so I'd be absolutely fascinated to cover this, especially as I covered the first adventure, um, Ghost Toasties, a few months ago, and it was very well received because it's a very funny adventure. Let's see if Scared Stiff stands up to that standard. And finally, we've got The Outcasts for the Star Trek role-playing game from Fazza. Now, the Fazza role-playing game fleshed out Star Trek fantastically. Um, very, very different to modern views, because obviously these came out before the next generation was out, and Star Trek went off in a completely different direction. But this does seem very um, organised within the movie era. So Kirk, Spock on the Enterprise uh, refit and the Enterprise A, this seems a fantastic era, era for role-playing in, 
and Fazza really fleshed this out amazingly. I'd love to cover more stuff for it. Let's see if this adventure, The Outcast, swims. And as usual, I've been publishing stuff over on DriveThruRPG. Now I'll put a link to the DriveThruRPG store in the description down below. If you check it out, it'd be very much appreciated. And of course, patrons of Librarian and Laird status get access to everything free of charge through a shared Google Drive. So if you check out the Patreon, also linked to down below, it'd be very much appreciated. And over on RPGGamer.org, well, I've started covering the High Republic era once again. Now, when it originally got released, I got into those comics and was quite enjoying the storytelling they were doing about the main character, Keeve Trennis. The way that character operated slightly different to other Jedi, and some of the interesting situations they were setting up, which were very different to the other eras. Especially the invasion of the plant creatures, the Drenga, which was an absolute fascinating storyline where the Jedi have to team up with the Huts to fight off an alien species which isn't evil, but is absolutely hostile to animal life, including Jedi and Huts. It was a brilliant storyline, even though the writers didn't have faith in it and abandoned it as time went on. And the storyline itself came to a drastic end when they blew up the space station which the era seemed to be all about, and killed off a bunch of the main characters. It was a really devastating end. So I dropped the comics back then, as I didn't really have any interest in picking up new char characters in this era, especially if they were going to jump around as much. But Phase 3 of the High Republic era has just started off, and they're back to the storyline with Keeve Trennis, picking up the storyline one year after the dramatic end to Phase 1. So, I have started covering it again. I'll be doing reviews and I'll be doing stats for the Star Wars D6 role-playing game, as I usually do. If you're interested in that kind of thing, then come on over and check it out on RPGGamer.org. Anyway, as usual, I think I've been wittering on for quite long enough, so thank you very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.